I'm going to adjust for age and gender. So maybe I want to know what the effect or the association, if you will, between having one kidney versus two kidneys is conditional upon subpopulations having the same gender and the same age. That is a perfectly well-defined question. That is what you will be consistent for answering. Bottom line. Okay. So that would specify the mean model, and that is what you're going to consistently estimate at the end of the day. Is it the true data generating mechanism for stones? In other words, is that model going to perfectly predict the rate of stones in any individual? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But does it answer the association that I want to specify by adjusting for age and gender? Absolutely. Okay. Good. Okay. So what we did then was we kind of stepped back and said, well, if I start with that guy, then I need to go. The thing that's left for me, now that I've got a consistent estimator of my regression model parameters, is I need to get the variance correct in order to be able to do valid inference. Okay, so we examined the variance function, and then for we went through the beta binomial example pretty rigorously when we talked about the Beatles data, right? So I thought, well, okay, maybe you've got this correlation within jars. We could fix up relative to a beta binomial example. I also had two other fixes there. One was just said, assume a simple scale fix, and the other was to do an empirical fix, right, on, on the variance. Okay, and we talked about the pros and cons of each of those things. So, nobody actually asked me why I was referring to that all along as the beta binomial model. Maybe it was just clear to you guys, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but at, at no point in time did the beta distribution come up inside of it, right? I just started by saying I've got this common world. And I derived down what the mean and the variance were the first two moments based upon that. Well, it turns out that if you wanted to, if you really believed in the beta binomial model, which I'm going to define for you in a second, tell you where the beta comes from, you can do this from a fully parametric point of view. In other words, you can do full maximum likelihood on that model and go to town. Okay. And again, why would anybody consider such an approach if I've already talked about all this kind of fixing of the variances and the robust variance estimator, well, they're doing it because they can gain back efficiency if they're right in the specification of the model, right? That's why. So Crowder was kind of one of the first ones to do this. He's also one of the first people to come up with the two-moment estimating equations. He kind of sat back and said, yeah, you can think about this as an estimating equation, but I could also think about building in this correlation, so to speak, in my binary data, or so my grouped binomial samples, by considering what we would call a hierarchical or a mixture model, right, to induce that correlation, okay? And so what Crowder did was he said, let's take YI here. In our case, YI would be the total number of dead beetles, okay, inside of a particular jar. PI would be the probability of death for a given beetle inside of the i jar. And then NI, of course, would be, in that particular example, the... Um, the number of beetles you start with inside of that jar. And in order to do this correlation, he said, well, let, and let's suppose that PI now is distributed beta, uh, following a beta distributional parameters, alpha and beta. Okay. So you can think about PI in this case as conditioning off concentration of the dose of the drug. Clearly, the dose of the drug affects the probability of cells survival. We saw that in the examples. That's not what we're talking about, though. We're saying, if I condition that out perfectly, and that was the only factor that was differential between the jars, then I should have to have a homogeneous probability of death of those beetles. You guys with me on that? So what he's saying is, yeah, but I'm going to think about the case where I've actually got a differential probability of death with inside of the jars conditional upon the concentration. And we talked about reasons for that. It might be, for example, resources with inside of the jar. It might be jar effects. For example, a solution left on the jar. It might be the amount of air or oxygen left inside of the jar. And so that's what this PI is trying to capture, is that heterogeneity conditioning out, after conditioning out the concentration of levels. Yeah, so that's uh, right. is, that, is that generally like a good definition for what a mixture model is? Is that uh, one of the parameters of our Y distribution uh, is itself probabilistic? Yeah, in some sense, I, I would say it's more of a definition of a hierarchical model, what we would call a hierarchical model. So you can think about the top hierarchy as PI. So I first sample a PI, and then from conditional upon that PI, then I sample my YIs, right, that I observe down. Now, it is a mixture in the sense that I'm mixing across different PIs, but that also has different connotations in statistics. So we might think about a mixture of two, say, normal distributions, and we're trying to figure out you know, what the optimal split is on these things. So I think probably a better kind of way to think about this is really thinking about the hierarchical aspect. That's a good question. Good.
Um, and again, this is really going to boil down to the way that we're inducing the correlation here is really through a, a random effect, is what we would call it, right? And so, so PI you could think about as this random effect. It's, a, it's an effect of the jar, for example, right? Each jar has its latent random effect that it's inducing a particular probability of death for the beetles on it, okay? And you guys have seen inducing correlation like this in another example, and that's the negative binomial example for count data on the homework. That was problem number one. Okay, you had a random effect that was ZI. Okay. Well, if you're going to do full likelihood estimation in this problem, then you need to derive down the, the, the marginal likelihood. First of all, before I do that though, I want to kind of justify why I was calling that other model a beta binomial model. Again, beta had never come up there in the past. Well, if you look at the marginal mean and variance of y, just do your, your iterative expectation rule on this guy, you're going to get something that looks like sample size times mean, probability success, but that's now dependent upon alpha and alpha plus beta, right? So these hierarchical parameters that are defining the beta distribution. If you look at the marginal variance of y, bring this guy down and put it into a nice form, you get something that looks like n times mu times 1 minus mu, good old binomial variance, times a 1 plus ni minus 1 times rho. Looking familiar to us? That's exactly what we had derived last time, okay, where I had this common correlation rho. Turns out that rho, when you do it from the beta binomial perspective, is really this function of alpha and beta. Something to note about this, um, as we go forward, I'm going to comment on it again in just a few minutes. In the beta distribution, alpha and beta, what's their range? They're positive, right? So this particular model, as you come at it from a full likelihood perspective, assumes what about rho? Always a positive correlation. In other words, that the inducing of the correlation is always positive. The, beetle, the, the beetles that are in a given jar are more alike one another, not less alike to the rest of the population, okay? So it does not allow for a negative correlation when you derive it out this way, okay? And pretty reasonable for most situations, to be honest. We talked about this. Most of the time, you're going to have an induced positive correlation inside of the jar, okay? So again, just going back, I treated this in our previous example as a quote-unquote semi-parametric model where I used this fact post hoc. I did the estimation on the exponential score and then came back in and fixed up the variances relative to this form. And I called that the beta binomial model of the variance. That was the rationale why. But if we wanted to do full likelihood, we could write down the marginal distribution for y. How do I get the marginal distribution for y? That's, again, the total number of beetle deaths. What I need to do is look at my full joint distribution here or y and p, and then integrate out p, that unknown probability of beetle death. If you do that, you'll get some nice forms here. Well, you'll get the beta function on top and bottom, and then, and then choose y and falling out in front. Okay. And so, by doing this, you know now what the marginal likelihood for y is. You can use that for full likelihood-based inference. Multiply these guys up across your independent jars and then go to town, and where again, you specify the parameters in terms of the mean model that's sitting here, alpha over alpha plus beta. That's, that's your underlying mean model. So far, so good on that? Okay. Sound like a fun homework problem? So let's go ahead and do that. Let's do the full likelihood estimation here, just to show you guys that this could be done as well. So I'm going to jump over into R. So I'm just reading in my Beatles data. I should be playing the Beatles, the B-E-A-T, though. <laughs> As I'm doing this, I think. I think we need, can we somehow edit that in, Ben? Of course. Okay, okay. Ben's favorite Beatles song is Blackbird, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's go with Blackbird, okay? These are important things to know about your students. It's it's good character check. You need to know what their favorite Beatles song is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Blackbird is acceptable. Oh, that's good. Yes. 
asthma guitar gently weeps. Uh, yeah. that, that, well, now that, you would probably graduate instantly if you were to set Oh, <laughs> got it. And, and it's while my guitar gently weeps. Wow. But that's okay. That's me. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read in the library AOD. AOD means analysis of overdispersed data. And so um, it turns out that there's an entire field of this, right? You guys are learning. And from there, I'm going to call the function beta binomes. That's the beta binomial model. Again, this is going to do full likelihood estimation. It's going to take that likelihood we just found to write down, do estimation for our model now. So it's a little different in terms of how you have to specify the model. You need to do a C bind on Y and NI minus Y. Okay, so that's different than what we had before. Before in the GLM model, I had Y divided by N and put in the weights. Okay, so just remember that as you go through. Um, so this is the exact same model I had before where I've got log concentration that's sitting here. And then the tilde one, just simply, I'll talk about this more as we get into generalized mixed models, but this just simply means I've got a random intercept is what that means. That's really what we derive now by having that p hat be different by each of these groups. So it just means that the underlying probability of, of uh, beetle death is changing in a constant fashion across these groups. Okay? It doesn't depend upon the concentration, for example. Okay, so that's what that tilde one is meaning. So if I do that and I fit this guy, let's go ahead and look at it. So a couple of things. You guys have been doing newton raphson And have you guys been noticing like how many steps it usually takes in an exponential family model? Four, five. Four or five, maybe at the most. Okay, so 128 on these hierarchical mixture models. The reason why is when you're integrating out that P, you get kind of odd shapes on that likelihood function. Okay. I'm saying that now because when we get to generalized linear mixed models, that's going to be a bear for us to do the numerical integration for the likelihood. Okay, it turns out to be kind of a sticky point. And you can start to see it here already with just a simple random intercept model, 120 iterations to get this thing to boil down. Okay. Um, okay. So a couple of things. We've got fixed effects that are coming from our coefficients. These are what we've had before. I'm going to compare these for you guys in just a minute to the binomial logistic regression model that we had previously. The other thing that I should note here is that this model implicitly assumes a logit link function. Okay, So it's the same interpretation of what you've had before. You are modeling the logit of the probability of beetle death as a function, a linear predictor of an intercept, and log concentration. Okay, so these have the exact same interpretation as our logistic regression model that we had coming out of the GLM. Okay. Okay. The next thing you have is that you have over dispersion coefficients, right? And so now I get this thing called phi that's sitting over here. Phi is equivalent to rho in my notation. Okay, I like to use rho because it truly is the induced correlation among beetles inside of the jar. But that's exactly what phi is. So we get an estimate of phi. This is now a maximum likelihood estimate for phi. Okay. What was our moment-based estimate for phi? Or, or for rho? Sorry. We had before. You guys remember? Pearson residuals. We got it off the Pearson residuals. Does anybody new, new, remember numerically what it was for this example? Yeah, it was about 0.085 or 0.086, somewhere in that range. Okay. So the MLE estimate for it in this case about 0.103. Okay, so pretty close is what I'm saying. If this thing would have came out to be 0.7, we got a problem. Okay, so just, uh, right. they're, they're pretty close to each other. We would not expect them to agree perfectly. Well, what's the benefit of going full likelihood in this case? Well, you get a few things back. Now you're, you're going back to full likelihood estimation, deviance, AIC if you're going to do predictive modeling in this case. Right, so we've already talked about what AIC means in the predictive model perspective. Okay. And so you would get that particular guy. Um, again, all of these things, though, the deviance for the likelihood ratio test in the AIC are conditioned upon the fact that you specify the likelihood correctly. Go through. The other nice thing that you do have here is that if you were scientifically interested in a JAR effect, you now can do inference on it. Right? In other words, here I can test whether rho is actually equal to zero or not. Okay, because a I've got a z value for a Wald statistic. I could also compare this thing down to setting rho equal to zero, which would be the binomial model in that 
case and do a likelihood ratio test between those two things, right? Again, assuming that my likelihood in the negative binomial case is specified correctly, that would be a valid test. Um, well, with a caveat. What do I know about phi in this particular likelihood model? Hmm. <coughs> I don't know if it's positive. It's just a parameter. It's got to be positive, right? Mm -hmm. The way it was derived, it's got to be positive. It's a function of alpha and beta. Those are both positive. Okay. So if I'm testing whether phi is equal to zero, we call that test a test on the boundary. The reason why is because under the null hypothesis, I am right on the boundary of what phi is allowed to be. Right? Phi, ha phi has to, in fact, be positive. Right? So you're kind of coming in on the, the outside of its range. Now, do you guys remember the regularity conditions we had for maximum likelihood theory? And when I wrote down all those regularity conditions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a... Uh there should be neighborhoods where everything is differentiable, right? Exactly. So, one of those regularity conditions is exactly what Arsenio said. I have to have an open ball mm -hmm. around the true parameter value. And what that means is I have to be able to approach that parameter value from both sides. This can't do that, mm -hmm. right? I can't come in from the negative values up towards zero as I'm going here. So, in fact, what happens is, in these particular cases, it turns out for this particular problem, and you guys can simulate it up when you're bored, it doesn't affect you too much, but really the theory does not hold there for giving you a valid LRT or a well test because you don't have an open ball around that parameter value under the null. You can't go to the negative side in this particular problem. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to see this come up over and over again. When I get into mixed effects models and we want to test variance components, you try and test a variance component that's got to be positive, equal to zero, which is what we're doing here, basically, then we're going to have to basically simulate up what the null reference distribution is going to be, because our theory breaks down for us. Okay, we're going to have to figure that out. Yes. So then why does this package provide this, this estimates? Again, in this particular problem, for this, uh, this intercept problem, it actually has pretty good operating characteristics here. I'm going to show you some examples where it actually breaks down quite a bit. The theory does not hold, but from a practical standpoint, you can pretty much trust it. But, but there is no theoretical result, is my point here, Francis, or I can say this is going to hold, and this is going to have an exact correct <coughs> alpha value, so at least that's some positive. This is operating characteristics, why do you say this is good? Operating characters, so, what, yeah, I, I apologize, I do throw that out, you guys have heard me throw that out from time to time. So what I would refer to here as the operating characters of this test means that it maintains the type 1 error rate correctly. Right? In other words, that the reference distribution under the null is approximated pretty well by a chi-square 1 distribution if I take the quadratic form on this guy. Why do we know that? Uh, so the only reason we know that is through simulation studies, basically. Okay. This. Again, the theory doesn't hold for that. Okay. And again, you know, where it's going to come into play later on is when we're testing various components and mixed effects regression models as we go through. And I'll show you examples where when we simulate it up, it is in fact off by quite a bit. That might be a good homework problem. Maybe I'll have you guys simulate it up here. Yeah? Uh, you guys can do it, right? Simulate it in a test these things out. Good. Yes? Do you all test? Um, on yeah. yeah, so all of that likelihood theory mm -hmm. breaks down, right, if I don't have an open ball mm -hmm. around my parameter of interest. So the wall test is just derived from all of that same likelihood theory, right, that everything's going off asymptotically normal, and that would be the correct sampling distribution mm -hmm. under the null. So likelihood ratio test, the wall, mm -hmm. they're all going to have problems there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Similar problems. And, and, and that, that, Sasha, just to make one other statement about that, it would be kind of intuitive because what do we know about the relationship between the three, like the triad of tests, if you will, that we have, right? The likelihood ratio, the wall, the score, <coughs> at least asymptotically, what happens with those three tests? Okay. They all converge to each other, right? They're all asymptotically equivalent. So one of them's got a problem. Okay. Right. Good. Very good. So let's go back then again and look at a comparison now. Let me just jump to my notes real fast just to make sure that we're following along on the same page. Again, just a few notes here. That phi is the row that we had before. That was my comment about test on the boundaries. 
Let's compare that now to the post hoc adjustments that we had. I'm just going to bring them up in R and we'll kind of compare the fits that we had going through here. So the first one was we just said, look, I'm just going to go with the good old, if you will, estimating an equation that starts by uh, just considering the exponential family estimating equation, right? And that is the binomial model that we had before. So going back to the notes, again, putting this in the context of everything that we have seen, I'm just simply saying what, what I really did with my GLM fit was I just took this as my estimating equation. I didn't really believe when I started that caper that I truly had a binomial distribution because I know that I've got clustering with inside of jars, or at least I can hypothesize that pretty easily in this particular case. So really what I'm doing is I'm just going to start with this particular estimating function when I put that GLM fit okay, to obtain parameter estimates. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I have a question uh, about this uh, boundary problem. Mm -hmm. So I think we had in our homework we had one of the like sub problems we needed to test the hypothesis whether this additional parameter is yeah. uh, significant. Yeah. And there was some um, some approach that they would say that the half of the mass is basically on zero, mm -hmm. and then you you have chi chi squared distribution. Yes. Right, so and you basically divide everything. So, yeah, what was the principle? Yeah, so what happens is um, the question is, is what is the degrees of freedom? Okay, and so we will see it later come up as we go through. Um, so it turns out that you're in between a mixture of chi squared distributions. Okay, the problem is you don't really know what the mixture is. The mixture depends upon the correlation structures within inside of the data. And so, as we get going forward, so the mixture that you were talking about is you could think about it as a, a mixture between a chi-square zero, that's your point mass of zero, and a chi-square one. And so, what most people do in practice, rather than taking the time to simulate up the reference distribution, is they just say, I'm going to go halfway. I'll assume I've got a chi-square half. And really, that's what, that's what they're doing. They're putting a half mass on zero and a half mass on a chi-square one. And so, what we will see later on is, like, for example, um, these words may not mean much to you right now, but we're going to talk about things like random intercepts and random slopes, okay, to allow those into a model. And if you want to test a random slope versus just a simple random intercept model, well, as the variance for a slope goes to zero, the correlation between those things has to go to zero as well, right? As one of them becomes constant, the correlation has to go constant. So am I testing one parameter or am I testing two parameters? And so it, it, it's a similar analogous concept here. And the answer is, well, you're testing somewhere in between one and two parameters, right? You're forcing one of them down to the boundary, so the other one has to go to the boundary with it. And so there we would use a, a mixture between a chi-square of one and two. That's why I'm bringing up that example. So we're going to extend that kind of philosophy going forward. The key point is, as you kind of start coming in towards the null, there is no parameter that's there, right? I mean, it's degenerate. Like, as you come down to zero, hence that's the, the half intuitively. It's a good point. And I skirted the issue when I had you guys do it on your homework. I kind of just said, do the likelihood ratio. Again, the chi-square of 1 in that case turns out to work fairly well. It's very analogous to this particular problem. Okay. And that's why I didn't feel so guilty about doing it. Guys. But we're going to spend a lot more time on being able to simulate up that normal distribution later to see what the effect is. That's what we're doing. Okay. All right. So again, my mindset in fitting that GLM model, just to make this clear, is again, I as an individual and a data analyst, I go through that by simply saying I'm just fitting an estimating function, right? And I'm solving that estimating equation that results from that guy. A lot of people would step back and say, this person is doing binomial regression. Well, you could look at it that way, but I don't really believe I've got a binomial model. I'm just getting an estimator off of this particular formula for estimating. Okay? And so. Let's go ahead and do that. I do that by fitting my GLM call. And if I take my summary from that guy and we compare back to what we had before, we're going to notice a few things. Okay, so again, part of this dispersion parameter is taken to be one, full binomial model. If we look at our estimates here, we get minus 17.9 and 6.27 roughly. Go back up to the maximum likelihood estimates that are coming off of 
are um, fit up here. I get minus 17.9 in this case, 6. Point, oh, wait, that's the same one. Sorry. I was like, that looks too, too close. I get minus 19.2 and 6.66 roughly. So they're similar to one another, which is what you would expect, right? Because the binomial model, even if it's wrong, it's going to be consistent. And so I know I should be estimating the same quantity. Standard errors are going to be different as well, though. Okay, right? So the standard error here, 2.26, 0.778. And if I come back up here, you're going to see it's 4.37 and 1.5. Now, you expect these to be bigger, for sure, relative to the binomial standard error three version of the model based variance, right? Because we know the model based variance estimates, on average, are off by about fourfold in that problem, right? That was our estimate of phi for the scalar model, okay? So they had better be bigger up there because this is at least accounting for some of the correlation and, and what's going on. Okay. All right. Good. So then we said, well, I know my standard errors are wrong. My estimate of phi is too large. So we can look at our other post hoc fixes. Those post hoc fixes, the quasi fit, where I assume that scale was here. Now, if you look at the scaled up standard errors, it's about 4.64, 1.59. Going back up here. It's about 4.38, 1.50, okay, as you go through. Parameter estimates on the, quasi, on the quasi fit do not change, right? Those are just the binomial parameter estimates. All I'm doing is fixing the variance up here. The weighting is the same on each of my observations. Now, truly, is it fair for me to compare these standard error estimates to the standard error estimates up in the beta binomial likelihood fit? Quiz for you guys. Not really. Why do you say not really? You know? Why is it not really fair for me to compare them? Because you post hoc fixed it, and you like that was like a model, actual model. You didn't take anything from data and feedback it. Mm. So this is a post hoc fix, I think. Exactly. Yeah. What are you going to say, Arsene? You know, maybe like the phrase that we're estimating different quantities. Yeah, I would argue. You're consistently estimating the same quantity, they're both, you know, so you should be consistent for the same quantity. But they're different estimators, right? So one has a different variance, true variance, than the other. They're different estimators. One puts my binomial weighting on these guys. The other one is doing negative binomial regression, full likelihood, right? So they're different estimators, their true variances are different. And if you look through your homework, I have a comment about that on your homework as well, when you do the negative binomial fit okay, inside of homework number one. And a lot of folks I was looking were comparing variances, and I understand why you were wanting to do that, because they're similar types of models, but they're different estimators, so they shouldn't have the same true variance. Okay? So when you compare estimated variances of the two of them, if they were to differ, well, that could just simply be because they have different true variances. You guys with me on there? There's a difference between truth of the variance of an estimator and then your estimate of what that variance is. Okay. In this case, they match up pretty well. And part of the reason why you would hope that they would match up is because, number one, we've got roughly a uniform design here. What, what do I mean by that again? When we talk about uniform design in this particular Close to 30 people for each time. Yeah, I've got roughly the same denominator, right, Jalen? And so I've got, so when I when I derive down that variance formula, remember it has an NI that's sitting there on the on the scalar multiplier term. So that thing would be roughly constant if I had a, a, an exchangeable correlation structure across my different jars. Okay. And so the other fact that they match up is because, well, the jars you can think about as just being pulled randomly right out of a lab. And so in some sense they become exchangeable as well. One another. Type immediately got put into one jar would be exchangeable for the type of real put in another jar. And then finally, our other post hoc fix, um, well, we did two, right? One was the, the post hoc beta binomial fix. That was the sandwich-based standard error. Again, the key thing here, so these are my beta binomial estimated standard errors. This is now saying I've got an estimator that's derived from the binomial weighting function, but then I'm going to fix up the variance by taking the cheese of my sandwich, so to speak, to be based upon the beta binomial estimate that I have, the method of moments beta binomial estimate. Okay? 
And then finally, the last one is the robust variance estimator in this case. And here you can see the robust standard error estimators tend to be lower than the other two. Okay, so look at, or look at these guys, or sorry, lower than the other three, in fact. If you look at these guys relative to the sandwich and then the, the scalar model, and then also if you think about the maximum likelihood estimator, these guys are smaller than all of them. Okay, um, And I commented already that I wouldn't be super keen on trusting the robust variance estimator in this problem because the sample size is really 10. Okay? It's 10 binomial samples. Okay? That's what Somewhere between 10 and 10 times 30, like roughly 300, but closer to 10. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, and by the way, so this function, robust.se.glm, so I've got three versions of basically the robust variance estimator. So one is you could do robust. I, I've commented on this in my code as well. If you just wanted the variance covariance matrix back, the robust variance covariance matrix, because sometimes you will, then you could just use robust.vcove.glm. That'll give you back just the variance covariance matrix. If you type in robust.se.glm, it'll give you the full gambit back. And then you could also do the exp fit with robust equal true, and that'll give you everything that's initiated back. So there's three different ways to get it. So when we try to gouge the effective sample size, should we think of it, um, like should we consider the correlation conditioned on our like uh, condition of interest or or not? Or like yes. So the answer is yes. So you want to condition out the systematic effects and then think about the residual correlation left after that. For the and wh why do you say that then that the true sample size is closer, closer to 10 than 10 times 30? Because in our case, is the correlation that huge? Remember, um, <laughs> binary data. So the answer is you look at it and it's like 0.085 to 0.1. That seems very small to us, but that's very high correlation for binary samples. And that's why I say that. Okay. So you can't really think about it on the continuous scale, like a correlation of 0.9 or being high below. So you say you have just a little bit of something here because of what you're saying. Um, but in the homework one for the Gale data set, you do even though the same thing happens. There's nine different groups, right? I, um, I don't think that there are nine different groups for that particular problem, actually. I think if you look at that problem, I believe that you have your residual degrees of freedom of 53 after you put the model. So you're right on the cusp. So if you look at my key for that problem, I say that I'm right on the cusp of me trusting the robust variance estimator in this case. If I were lower, I probably would result to something more like the scale. Sure. So outside of this class, I didn't get into 11, right? Yep. So um, I hear you say the sandwich estimator and then the robust kind of interchange. Yep. What's the. Yeah, it, it's a horrible kind of um, semantic dilemma. Um, mm -hmm. There are three names that people will refer to this robust range estimator. Again, when I'm talking about this right here, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. This is like A inverse U transpose A inverse, right? I take the empirical variance of the score. Inside. In the literature, as you read this, I would say that if I was going to put numbers on these things, 80% of the time people will refer to it as the robust variance estimator. Okay? But they will also refer to it as the sandwich variance estimator, because it is sandwiched, right? But my, my cheese on the sandwich is now you need transpose, as opposed to a model-based okay, interior. And then you will also hear people refer to it as the Huber-White estimator as well, right? So they'll use <coughs> that terminology will be referred to right down here as well. And again, Huber-White really wasn't talking about you transpose per se. They were saying there's this B that is the true variance of the score, right? Okay. So I will apologize. You guys got to keep me honest if I do. Because up here, I talk about this as sandwich, right? Because it is a sandwich estimator, truly, coming from the you know, system. But now I have a model-based B, basically, sitting inside of that sandwich. Again, most people would do not do, I want to put this in context for you guys, most people would not do this particular model-based fix. Why? So they don't like cheese? No. No, you don't know cheese. Yeah, you don't know cheese. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. <laughs> so technical terminology. This is good. You guys should not give talks like this. You don't know cheese, you know. No, they don't know what goes in here. 
And so, if I assume that it's beta binomial, if it's that particular form, if I'm going to believe that, what should I have done in the first place? Use the <laughs> Go right to the likelihood, right? Go right to the likelihood and just maximize the likelihood. And so that's why I say, you know, when people talk about the sandwich estimator, they're usually talking about the UU transpose, because if I'm going to make some sort of parametric assumption on it anyways, I probably would have just went ahead and did maximum likelihood estimation on it to begin with, right? As I went through. So, so that's the rationale behind that. So when you hear those three names, you generally are thinking UU transpose in the literature, any, any of those three connotations. And I apologize, but that is just the reality of the situation. That's how people refer to these things. Okay. okay. So we will pick up on lecture. So, so from this point forward, let me leave you guys with something to look forward to as we go. As we move forward now, I'm going to switch over to correlated data. But the strategy, what I've been setting up the entire time from the beginning of 211 is what we're going to take into correlated data now. I'm going to first start off at it from just an estimating the equations perspective. We're going to do weighted least squares on variance covariances. Okay. And then we're going to take the weight and least squares and we're going to say, now let me add distributional assumptions onto it. That's going to give us a linear mixed effects model. We'll talk about the pros and cons of those two things. Then I'm going to jump down to discrete data. And I'm going to go at it from an estimating equations perspective. And I'm going to build it up to a parametric model. So there's going to be kind of a method to the madness. We're going to compare about what we get and what we lose on each one of these things as we go. Okay? So from this point forward, I mean, we've really been talking about correlated data already. But from this point forward, we're going to be talking about now our responses are going to be vectors. That's what we're going to do. Okay? All right. So if you guys can do me a favor, grab a lecture five on your way out the building. There should be plenty for anybody that wants one.